starting a podcast as we go live saying this is one of the main reasons we broadcast live is because um, I'm kind of lazy and <laughs> and be, because I'm kind of lazy once we yeah. once the once the live stream is done it's yeah. then done we yeah. don't have to edit it we don't have to you know put it together or anything but the other thing is if there is a, a momentous momentous balls up and there is occasionally we also are recording it so we can pull everything down fix it and put it back up i had to do yeah, that yeah. the other week with someone because my big fat fingers pushed a button they shouldn't have and we dropped out for two minutes so you didn't realize well i did realize at the time but we just fixed it up uh, afterwards so yeah so that's one of the one of the reasons we live stream as we are right now live streaming to the internet with maria foy good morning good morning morena happy mum happy child is yep. uh, is the blog uh let's do this while we're talking about it and bring up uh the blog i'll put it on the right page sorry hang on because i've got a youtube channel up as well there we go happy mum happy child Maria Foy, uh, got a parenting question. Join the Parenting View Facebook. Over 20,000 incredible parents ready to answer your parenting-related questions. So as they say in this day and age, you've built a real community, uh, I guess, primarily around parenting and mm. then kind of uh, moving out for there, including I saw on your YouTube channel you're doing reaction videos and stuff now as well. I, I kind of feel like I'm at this point in my life where I actually don't know who I am and what I'm doing. So I'm kind of like trying a whole lot of different things. Um, yeah, the reaction thing is fun. But again, you saying before that you're lazy. I'm also very lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I think if people were listening and watching, they'd probably go, oh, they're not lazy. They're just, they're working smarter, not harder. <laughs> so that's that's the other way to, to nutshell laziness. Yeah. That's a positive spin on it. <laughs> I was um just as you joined me, you know, previous to us going live, I was I get stuck in YouTube rabbit holes all the time. And there was mm. a rabbit hole of like the twenty five most amazing things you've seen in sports. And I laughed because the introduction of it said something like, Here's twenty five things you've no one's ever seen before, yet all of them were broadcast on television. Ah. And I'm like, Well, obviously that voiceover is not quite accurate because Lots of people have seen these before. You might be highlighting them for us, and thank you for doing that, but lots of people have seen yeah. them before. Yeah, so, hey, look, thanks for coming on board. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to having a chat with you and at the end of it being a better parent. That's my expectation, <laughs> just so you know. Don't, just get rid of that right now, mate. <laughs> <laughs> that is not what you're going to get from me. <laughs> Tell me about Happy Mum, Happy Child. Tell me about uh, the origin story and uh, and and where it kind of all came from. So um, I started it in 2014 when my son was six months old. So I had a two and a half year old and a six month old and I was getting my, ripping my hair out, trying to think of things to do with my daughter who was older whilst looking after my son. So I started doing these activities with the kids that I found on like American or Australian websites. And I started sharing them with my friends and my friends encouraged me to sort of start my own website off the back of that because there was nothing really in New Zealand at the time that was like that. So that's where Happy Mum, Happy Child came from, was basically doing things, putting effort in that made your, made your kid happy, which ultimately made you happy. And when you're happy, the kid's happy. It's like this cycle. Um, and then I started talking about my struggles with depression and just parenting in general. And I think it was right time, right place, you know, 2014, 2015. And I kind of just blew up from there. And I've, I've gained quite a nice following and a nice community around that. Um, it's definitely had its ups and downs over the years, as you do with social media. But overall, I really enjoy talking to people about parenting and like I said before, I'm not really sure where I'm at with my life. My kids are getting a bit older now and I don't really know what I'm doing with myself. So happy mum, happy child is still there. Still about activities with kids and blogging and, and about my life and stuff, but I just don't know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> when you when you say don't know what you're doing, I mean, there's a couple of things that come to mind. Normally people yeah. who are sort of creatives or creators um, yeah. or people who wear several hats and I had this conversation with Emma Espiner just the other day I always say to them what's on your business card and that always makes them laugh because they're like I don't know and it sounds like you're one of those people you have several hats on and you do several things and it's kind of yeah. hard to nail down what you do yeah I, and I, I'm a bit the same people ask me what I yeah. do now 
and I, I've kind of nutshelled it down to, it sounds a bit wanky, but I create digital content because with one of my other hats, I work with businesses and help them with their advertising and yeah. media. So that that's sort of, I think that's my nutshell now, which is also very broad. It's like, what do you do? Well, I breathe. Yeah, I know. Well, we all, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I work on that all a, day, every it's, day. <laughs> it's a pretty broad topic, but yeah, that that's what it is. But also this idea is, um, is it, as part of it, because as your children get older, are you finding it more difficult to kind of communicate your parenting things? Are there less parenting things to talk about? Or is it just that you've yeah. been doing this for six or seven years and is it kind yeah. of just evolving? I think it's a bit of both. I think, you know, when you're, a, when you're a parent for the first time or you've got young kids, your whole life is about your children and it can be very overwhelming and you can feel very alone and the internet is an amazing place for feeling a little bit less alone. So over the years, it's gone from this really intense space where kids, 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 it's all about kids. And now they're at school and it's like a little bit more about me, still about kids, you know, primary responsibility is being a parent, but it's not, not as intense. And so for me, I guess I just feel like, okay, well, I've got a little bit of myself back now because I'm in, in this really privileged position where I can be a stay at home mum. Mm -hmm. So happy mum happy child is my business but obviously parenting is my number one priority so as the parenting side of it sort of dies away the business side of it sort of comes more into play but i kind of just don't know what i'm doing so i think you know every age brings its own challenges and it's just at the moment i feel like it's i'm not as interesting as i used to be <laughs> like my life is not as challenging it is challenging it's just it's different you know it's interesting uh, to, to think about that because and i'm not saying you've done this mm -hmm. so so let me make this very clear i'm not suggesting that you uh ha have gone down this path but sometimes we find an identity and a, a negative so you're talking about depression yeah. and sort of thing it's it's sort of easy pat when i say easy i don't mean easy because i mean it's all, all, always a grind but it might be easier to find content from saying how life is terrible than yeah. to find and, and have people go, oh gosh, you really resonates with me, rather than go, hey, life's amazing at the moment, um, and people kind of go, well, mine's not. So I don't know. Maybe part of it's to do with as we evolve and grow and mature, um, yeah. we it's, it's it's I don't know. Is it harder to connect with someone on a positive than it is on a negative? I, I absolutely agree with you. I think that there's this big space out there on the internet where everyone's like, I just want reality. I just want to feel validated in my negative feelings and in my the negative stuff that's happening in my life and so they connect with other people who are like man i've got it really hard and they bitch and they moan and they enjoy listening to people who are bitching and moaning because it makes them feel a little bit better about themselves and when you see someone who's positive all the time it can feel like eh, like shut up and i guess perhaps that is one aspect of it, although I still bitch a lot about about things. I mean, I can make anything into a rant if I really want to, but <laughs> it's, it, I, I definitely think we're all looking for validation and it's usually validation of the negative shit we're going through, you know? Although I also think maybe as a, you know, what you have done is, and, and look, I'm not, I hope I'm not speaking out of school here because I don't actually know your story yet. That's mm. why I wanted to talk to you. But maybe mm. you've made a online persona, and I don't mean it's fake, I mean this is why people know you, about struggling and getting through the good stuff. So if that was to flip into getting through positive stuff, it might be harder. Whereas you look at people who do the opposite and they come out and they show their bling and they flash the cash and they talk about all the positive, that can be quite popular as well but that's sort of where they started i wonder if the difficulty yeah. is evolving into something new rather than yeah. being positive or negative once you're i'm not and negative such the wrong word i'm talking yeah. about talking about difficult things that that's what i'm uh, meaning yeah. Yeah. Down yeah yeah as, as about to as opposed to making it rain you know um so i don't know it's, it's interesting to think about about transitioning as well because there were a lot of uh, content creators out there, you know, YouTubers and, and, and digital content creators who have a thing. Yeah. And uh, a lot of them are huge for, mm. uh, like my kids watch, well, used to watch a thing called Dan and Phil. And apparently one oh, of them, yeah. one of them just felt like he was done because he was at the end of it and there was nothing else he wanted to do. So he's gone. And I don't know which one it is yeah. because I don't watch them, but so Phil's <laughs> yeah. left now or Dan's left now, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. And the other one's just gone because, it's like they'd got to the end of what they wanted to do and 
there was no i don't know i'm i'm now putting my opinion on top of it i don't know this but there's no transition yeah. into how do we turn this from talking to 14 year olds to talking yeah. to you know 22 year olds or whatever they're trying yeah. to do yeah yeah i think that is um that's the thing is and that's kind of where i'm at is finding that transition but my problem is i'm here and great let's transition to something but i've got no idea what i want to transition into and so i've been doing like five or six different things over the years to try and figure out what it is exactly i want to do and nothing's really stuck but some of that i think is just my inability to project manage if that makes sense like i start a project really really excitedly and i really get on it and then after a while it just kind of fades into oblivion <laughs> but i don't know if that's a sign that perhaps it wasn't meant to be or you know i'm feeling you preach it i understand <laughs> i understand what you're saying completely um yeah but yeah uh, there's always there's always things on the boil i mean there's that old saying there's yeah. many irons in the fire at all times yeah. and i think i remember i had a business mentor when I was living in Auckland for a while and he was very much, you know, the biggest problem with your business, Pat? And I was like, what's that? What's that, Ray? He goes, you, you are the biggest problem in your business. And I'm like, oh, cheers, dude. That's good to hear because that's the one thing I can't kind of change. But what he was saying is because I was this kind of, you know, ethereal sort of, you know, uh, ideas person, I, I wasn't very good at nutting it down and going, you know, in business they talk about, um, going narrow and going deep you know yeah. like like if you're selling a product they talk about not having too big a range go narrow and go deep with what you're best with whereas i'd be yeah. like i'll do this and i'll do this and i'll do this and i'll do this and, I'll, and then i yeah. never did any of them none of them ever went deep yeah this is me i feel like I've, this is a direct reflection of myself <laughs> and i know that i'm the problem and my problem is like how do i stop being the problem like what do i need to do to get out of that that situation and like sometimes I can see it sometimes I have these incredible moments of clarity and I'm like I know what I need to do I just need to do it but then I'm like oh I just don't want to do it <laughs> you know I don't know if I have the stamina to do it or you kind of talk yourself out of certain situations like I have all these big ideas in my head I'm like yeah I really want to like start a tv show but I'm like well I know I can't just do that you know Why not? I've got to kind of walk the walk, walk the steps to get up to that point yeah, but you bas but but you basically are doing a television show. You've got your YouTube channel. I mean, we've yeah, we've said yeah. we've said many times in conversations about the entry point these days. I mean, uh, you can't see them. I would have set them up to show you if you want. But I've got three cameras in this little studio of mine in my home. They're all four K mm. cameras. Um, mm. You know, I, I, although I'm using sort of a radio mic setup sort of thing, it's not that difficult to to figure out how to, how to put together at the very least like some um you know a, a an idea to then pass on to a production company or directly to a yeah. television station that's not a that's not a big thing really i mean if you have an idea uh, i get i get stuck in the the fact that to me it seems like a big thing mm. like i know that in the scheme of things it's probably not that difficult but from like a mum sitting in a house in the middle of south auckland i'm like oh that kind of seems too hard you know without actually knowing the full picture and actually it probably wouldn't take much to actually make that come through I start, or like at least start it i started something not too long ago i haven't it's not like a it's not like an, a thing but it's a, it's more of an yeah. idea and i've started to reach out um to kind of get some like-minded creative people together yeah mm -hmm. and it can be as simple as one of those silly private uh, facebook groups to start sharing ideas and you know and uh resources as well uh yeah. to be able to help out each other with, with with doing various things and i mean i think so much of the time whatever you're doing in life and whatever you're doing for yourself or in business or whatever it's finding those partnerships to come on board with you that can either help you that are affordable for you to bring on board that yeah. can can get the vision you've got and come with you or whatever it is um and yeah, it's, it's. I know for sometimes they're, they're hard to find. I, one of my friends that I work with on this, Jason, and people who have seen some of the earlier podcasts, the first seventy-five, 
uh, will know Jason because he was he produced every single show since um, the pandemic kicked in and I've moved my studio home. We've all um, been less active working together, but without Jason, there is no there's no podcast because yeah. he's he's my technical guy. He basically he's basically helped me jerry rig, you know, a whole bunch of equipment to make all this work. And yeah. um, you know, even though he's not here in the studio with me on an active time now, I still consider him part of the team. And as this grows, and as hopefully, fingers crossed, it becomes monetizable and more, or I should say, more monetizable. Then, um, then Jason comes back and he and he gets uh, gets a reward for his input. But uh, yeah. I, I was lucky to find a person with whom, if I hadn't found him, none of this would happen. Um, Did you set out knowing you needed somebody else? Um, I can tell you the story super quick. I've told it a few times, so not to uh, <laughs> belabor it. Um, when actually we're on Periscope right now, so if people are, are watching or listening to this uh, somewhere, be aware that if you come follow me on Twitter at Pat Britton, then every one of these shows goes out live on Twitter via Periscope because it's the best Twitter model. And as an aside, uh, the lovely Dave Gibson from LMNOP, he's going to be with us on Thursday night at 8 p.m. So come jump on Twitter and have a beer with me and Dave from LMNOP. That'll be cool fun. <laughs> Little plug there. That's, you know, that's the first time I've ever done a plug in the middle of a show. But there you okay. go. That's what it's perfect for. That's perfect timing. What a segue. <laughs> um, but when Periscope came out, I had yeah. a little epiphany and went, holy shit, I've got like a 4K broadcast camera in my in my bedroom. Because basically if you had, you know, one of these things um, oh, that, yeah. that could do 4K, then you yeah. could broadcast. And all I try to do is figure out how do I get decent audio into there as well. Now, I never ended up going on Periscope at that stage, but that was the beginning point to go, okay, I can figure this out. I can figure out what I want to do. And then when I got to this iteration, and this is number 150, this episode, yeah. Yeah. Um, I had Jason, he's a mate, he was on board. Uh, we used his cameras and stuff because he's a videographer for the first probably 50 or 60 episodes. We were in a, yeah. a building that was giving us free space and we just grew it slowly oh. from there. So so I started off no, not thinking I needed uh, technical help, but when yeah. that sort of evolved into actually, if we're going to do this, let's do it right, it became yeah. very evident to me that I could get someone on board with me as long as I could find someone who would yeah. then um, make those technical questions answerable immediately rather than me. I'm, I'm a good end user, but I'm not very good at setting things up, which would take me, you know, a week to do something that Jace could do in an hour sort of thing. So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah. So, in the end, yes, I probably needed it, but it certainly could have been a more simplistic iteration that I yeah. didn't. So there was sort of a, a, a it went both ways. Yeah, because I get stuck in. Um, I'll just do it myself. I, it's not no point in getting anybody else to help me. I'll do it myself. But I think that 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 in itself is is what's hurting my ability to move forward is actually I probably need someone to help me and give me a kick, kind of like a business mentor probably. Um, I'm pretty good on the technical side of things, but I probably just need someone to come and tell me what to do. Collaboration is a godsend. Mm. Uh, one of the problems in New Zealand, and you probably don't, I don't know, I don't want to get into your business dealing necessarily. <laughs> you may not you, you may not be like this because I think you've got about 400,000 on your Facebook page, is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, three ninety. Yeah, so that's a very monetizable number of people. But for most of us out there who aren't quite at that that level, uh, oh. one of the biggest uh, hurdles is money, because yeah. you know I probably spend twenty hours, ten ten to twenty hours a week uh, on this podcast. You know, on yeah. doing things in the background, on looking for guests, on communicating with people, on seeing if I could sell sponsor. I used to have a sponsorship just over my shoulder here. It was for a vaping company. <laughs> But yeah. um, but but since new legislation came in, they had to pull out, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. So so doing all that kind of stuff, and that very quickly turns into, uh, like if I have a, I, I sometimes have weeks where I've got four or five podcasts on. That might be a forty hour week, and so yeah. it becomes quite difficult to justify all the time you're putting into a product that's not returning an income. But in saying yeah. that, I, I can't release it quite yet. But there is a plan for not just me, but for numerous um, podcasters, content creators uh, to get a bit of pay coming up in the next. I, I, I hoped it would be going before Christmas, but maybe it'll be just after Christmas. And so, yeah, um, yeah anyone out there who's 
doing the digital thing, if they want to be involved, they can just contact me and I can tell them how to do it. But an actual way that people can get money in their pocket every single month. Yeah. And once we start growing those, see what they do in America is because if you've got a, a, a million, you know, podcast followers in America, that's a monetizable amount. Yet a million people in America is three fifths of fuck all. If you look at the yeah, actual like, landscape, yeah. <laughs> like your 400, yeah. your 400,000 is hugely more uh, powerful than a million in, in, uh, in America. But for some yeah, reason, yeah. New Zealand's a little bit behind in that understanding of what we can do with, with the digital medium. So, but you know, that, I think that's a big I one. Think I think the financial is a big one because yeah. you know, this is my 150th podcast. Yeah. One, of, one of the reasons I've been able to do this is I, I have another job, which I set my own hours. I have a studio, which is in my house, you know, all these mm. things that I've done. Um, but most people will do 10 podcasts and then go, Oh, I can't do this anymore. And that's what happens. It's like, yeah. So I was lucky in that when my audience started growing, I think I got to about 15 or 10 to 15,000 followers on Facebook. It was so long ago that back then that was, that was quite a lucrative number for people. And so I did start getting approached for sponsors. Um, and my business, so when I say I have a business, my business is now advertising. So, yeah. which is essentially using my platform as an advertising space. Um, and I do, I even have, I, I have an agency that helps to manage my work because of the amount of requests that come in. And I don't know how long it'll last, um, you know, social media is such a i don't know you know one minute it's amazing then i mean i don't really know about facebook anymore i feel like facebook might be a dying platform um so you know i've got four hundred thousand followers over there but i find it really hard to get any traction on ads anymore i don't have the the same pull power that i used to over there you know instagram is kind of like the place where it's at at the moment but and of course tiktok TikTok, yeah. Well, I don't know if I'm really meant for TikTok, but I'm there. But <laughs> well, I mean, I, I had on a few weeks ago, Uncle Tix, and um, you oh know, yeah. he he very quick. Oh, well, I don't know. It was very quickly, but got to a million TikTok followers, and that's huge. I mean, I was just looking at the numbers because America is sixty sixty times our size, give or take. Yeah. You know, your four hundred thousand Facebook followers in a New Zealand company is the equivalent of twenty six million in the US. So. Oh, okay. Because that would yeah. be that would be sixty times the size. Obviously, not all your followers are going to be in New Zealand because you know, happy yeah. mum, happy mum, happy child is a fairly universal kind of thing yeah. that could be Very anywhere cool. in the world. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, TikTok's incredible. I I look at TikTok and I think it's definitely for the younger generation. I don't think it's for people like myself, but people like myself are definitely on there and building big, large followings from it. But it definitely makes me feel old, you know, looking at like you say, Uncle Turks and Judah and like all these upcoming social media stars that have millions and millions of views. I'm like, wow, that's incredible. Don't know if I could do that. Well, it probably okay. means that people like yourself, um, and who knew we'd be talking about, you know, your business plan for the next five years during this podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's interesting that you would say that when you've got little kids, it's all about the kids, 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 kids. Yeah. Because... I don't know. I mean, I've got three children. Uh, mm -hmm. Now they're 16, 14, 11. Oh, but, yeah. Okay. But, I, but I'm finding there's as many <laughs> issues and topics oh, yeah. and things to talk about. I mean, yes, they, it's, it's, it's very nice not having, uh, not having to focus on them as much because they're like yeah. proper little people now, not just, you know, yeah. babies. Um, yeah. but you know, I'm, I'm in fact, my 14 year old, I started a conversation with her just yesterday about university and, wow. and the only reason I did was I did some work with another, a, a, a girl who's 18, um, who was about to go to university and, and she wanted some help to look up some stuff. And I'm a pretty good, you know, I'm a, I'm a good data miner. I can go in and find information. Yeah. I would have been a good <laughs> criminal. You know, I could find out all sorts of information about people. <laughs> In another life. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I hadn't done it before. And I went through and I found out all this information. Like uh, if you've got a, they call them gen, and, and I target, they call them general, um, general degrees, things like a BSc or a BA or a BE oh, yeah. or they, yeah. they're more generalized. They call them generals. Oh. And basically level two NCEA, if you get an excellence or a merit, 
yeah. at level two. So for old farts like me, that's sixth form or sixth form yeah, sniffing like, it. Oh, me too, because you're talking in another language, mate. Yeah. So, <laughs> Give me the forms. <laughs> so, so if you if you do a sixth form and you get uh, basically, let's say an A or a B in our language, yeah. it's called a merit or an excellence in this language. Okay. You've got direct entry into all those papers. Oh, wow. So I, would, I started talking to my 14-year-old who's going into NCA level one next year. Not not that yeah. I'm a, I'm not being a, a tiger mum or anything, but, you know, I'm going, we should start this conversation because at the end of next year, it would be good yeah. to be thinking about, you know, what we want to do and actually actively start talking about education in that second year of NCA rather than the third year of NCA, which is our seventh form, going into yeah. university. So. So, yeah, so look, I mean, a, a, an example of a topic for an older kid that could be, you know, a, a six-week podcast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I think sometimes I get, um, because I show so much of my life, I'm also very aware. Uh, there's certain things that I can't show anymore. I can't talk about for the, my children's privacy because I know that there's lots of kids at school that watch and listen and to their parents watching me, and I don't want that to ever get back to them on a negative Part. So That's I have interesting. To be so yeah. Cool. And because it does, like my my kids are very um, they're naive, and I love that about them. They live in their own childlike world, even at six and eight or nine. She turned nine yesterday. Like, and I love that. They have no clue what I do. Chloe often says to me, "Mum, mum, are you famous?" And I'm like, <laughs> "No, I mean, a little bit, but not really. Like, people know who I am, and that that's actually does not care about." what I do and so sometimes like I did an ad recently an ad that was on tv and all the kids at school saw it and she said mom, mom the kids keep telling me that they see you and she's just got no concept that of this other life that I kind of live so all this stuff can get back to her if I'm not careful or get back to them it's a really interesting space on social media so Whilst I can have certain conversations, I can't have, sometimes I feel like I can't really get into the nitty gritty because I don't want it to go back to her or them. Do you know what though? That in, in and of itself, and I'll, and I'll give you what, um, I'm not with my kid's mum anymore, but when we were, mm. that in of itself is a massive conversation. So mm. when my kids, I've, I've worked in radio for 20 years before I started mm. doing my own independent stuff, I've never once said my children's name on the radio. I've never once said my children's name in this broadcast. I'll talk yeah. about Miss 14 or Miss 11 or, you know, yeah. whenever that, but, I, but I've never once said their names. Um, mm. And that's a, a similar thing. It's like, uh, it's a privacy thing and, and whatever. But when they were at primary school, and uh, all of mine are out of primary school now, I thought the schools in New Zealand were missing a trick certainly the schools are, we were involved with, because they would put the kids' names onto digital media. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't want my children's names on digital mm -hmm. media. You know, I actually am quite careful with having my kids' names out there for their privacy. This is the first yeah. generation of children that are going to have a digital footprint from the day they're born yeah. to the day they die. I don't see any need to starting it when they're seven yeah. uh you know i've got friends and bless them if you know who you are when i say this i'm not no offense intended but they'll have a baby and they'll make a hashtag for their baby's names yeah and so then you can go onto instagram and use the hashtag and find pictures uh, yeah. of this child from literally the day, the day they were born mm. um and i think and so what i said to the school was I, i'm happy for my kids to be on the internet i'm not happy mm. for them to be identifiable Same. so yeah. let's say that my child's name's sarah it's not but let's say that it is so um. i say i don't care if you put sarah from room eight this is sarah from room eight's yeah. artwork that's fine yeah. but i don't want you to put sarah brittenden room eight yeah, yeah. and actually, actually it, like it was a gap they didn't have that in between they had either we can put your kid on the internet or we can't and i think that mm. what you're talking about and obviously you're talking about something a bit different like I understand what you're talking about. You know, I, okay. I, I hear, I follow a, a comedian called Bert Kreischer who is fairly raw and he talks about his daughters in ways that I would be shocked to talk about. Like he talks about having 
period parties with his daughters and that kind of stuff when you know yeah. when, when it comes for the first time that kind of stuff would yeah. be hugely embarrassing so i get the embarrassing yeah. side but there's also the yeah. privacy side as well yeah yeah when i started happy mum happy child i didn't say my kids names um and then i decided i would i don't know if in hindsight that i regret that um, but certainly the implications of having their names out there are so much more um, serious now. You know, if I, right. I often think back, like, what if I didn't show, th- what if I didn't show their faces and what if I didn't say their names? Then no one would know who they were. They would know who I was, but they wouldn't know specifically who they were. Um, but then, yeah, I think it, I think that, I think your point is incredibly valid and i think it should be an option that you don't create a like a digital footprint from a young age like you let your children do that themselves when they're older and, and you know when they do if they do what they want because social media and the internet is a scary place to be and you really i don't want my kids anywhere near social media like i said before my kids are very naive they really don't know anything about anything and i'm so happy for it mm. i don't my daughter has only just started talking to me about a phone i'm like what do you want a phone for and she's like oh because other kids games. have got them. Yes, because the other kids have them. And yeah. I'm like, oh, for goodness sake, screw those children. Stop giving the kids, young kids, big phones like that. But my daughter said, yeah, but I just want to play on games. And I said, but you know that a phone is is to ring people on. It's actually not, like, showing my age. I'm like, phones were invented to ring people on. <laughs> they were not meant to be for playing games. You've basically just got a small device at this point. Yeah. But um, it's, Yeah technology look i i i I sometimes come off like a bit of a old curmudgeon when i start having conversations around phones and stuff but um i I, i'm so firmly of the opinion that i am a parent Mm. and my children even my children who are you know becoming young adults as teenagers now are still the children and if i say your phone's not allowed in your room at night time then that's the rules of the house uh my kids got phones when they were in high school yeah uh we do this thing and in fact i just bought one the other day so this like this is my phone but i just bought another phone the other day which is going to be my this new business idea i was just talking about for for podcasters so it's going to be the phone number for that but also it's going to be what we call the whanau phone so when my kids go into intermediate school we have a whanau phone which basically means if they go to the movies with a friend, if they go and stay somewhere, they can take the phone with them. It's not yeah. it's not theirs. doesn't belong to them. They have no rights to yep. it. There's no games on it other than dad's games. No, there's no games on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but it's but it's the Fano phone. And they yeah. and my I've so I've got two at high school and one going into intermediate school next year. Um, they want she, she won't have a phone okay. until secondary school. And yeah. I see kids at primary school eight nine ten with with these and i'm like yeah as soon as if, let me be blunt parents if you're listening as soon as you give your child a smartphone yeah. they get access to porn i don't I, give a, absolutely i don't give because you know what if they've got a smartphone at school then they're on the yeah. school wi-fi and even if your little darling is yeah completely innocent and naive and that's and and look i think mine are probably like that there's one mm. little shit in the classroom who's not oh, yeah. who yeah. then shows the others porn yeah. so if nothing else just be aware that when you do this to your eight-year-old they are going to see porn have you watched that thing on facebook that video about social media and on netflix do you mean no, nah, no, nah, not the social dilemma. It's another one that basically talks about the same thing. It talks about, it's great giving your, your kids access to the internet, but you're actually giving them access to pornography. And when you give a- kids access to pornography, it actually changes their entire being when it comes to sex, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to interacting with other people. And it can turn them into these creatures that are not normal people that, because they've had access to pornography. Um, it's actually quite fascinating. I have to remember what it's called. I don't remember what it's called. But, if, um, if you can remember it and send it through to him, we'll put it up on the, the DOC Facebook page as well. There's another yeah. one called, there's a guy called Simon Sinek, and I, I've talked about this numerous times. He does a conversation. I know that I'm looking off to the side of this because I'm looking at my screen so I can bring it up. <laughs> um, he does a conversation about millennials in the workplace. 
Um, and even though it's not really relevant um, to millennials who are, well, they're not even really millennials, are they? Uh, the Gen Z now, aren't they? Um, it's not really yeah. relevant to them and their life because it's about the workspace. There is a there is a moment in it, and I will I will bring it up to show people, even if it gets me pulled from YouTube. That's all right; it's worthwhile. So then people <laughs> people can see what it looks like, right? So if you see it, it looks like this. Simon Sinek on millennials in the workplace, but he does this part, and I know where it is because I've watched this several times with my with my kids. It's about here. Mm -hmm. Hi, 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 hi. <laughs> Because it feels good when you get a response. And right? he talks about phones. Right? And he talks about social media. That's why we go back 10 times to see if, and if it's going, if our, my Instagram is growing slower, I would, I, I, did I do something wrong? Do they not like me anymore, right? The, the trauma for young kids to be unfriended, right? So the, there you go. You've got, you've, got, you've got a bit of a gist from it, just from that little few yeah. seconds. Um, so I would, I would get every parent who's going to give their phone, their kid's phone, to go and check out Simon yeah. Sinek on Millennials in the Workplace. Because one of the things he says is the synapses and stuff that get fired off in your brain with positive reinforcement from social media yep. is the same as drugs and alcohol. Yes. And I think maybe sex as well. And yeah, the point he I... the point he makes is, you know, would you leave your liquor cabinet, American liquor cabinet, would you leave your booze open yeah. and available freely uh, to your 13 year old? Yeah, I just was I'm looking very briefly then to see if I could find what that documentary was called. It's called Childhood 2.0. I'll see if I can find it. Yeah, Social Media Dangers documentary. There we go. Look at that. See, this is what we do in this in this world. Let's have a look <laughs> at that. Childhood 2.0. Yeah, so don't watch it around kids because... This film includes yeah. uh, matter, subject matter that may not be suitable for children. It's an hour and a half. Mm. So there you but go. Right. What you just showed then about the positive reinforcements that social media gives you, and then it goes on to talk about how great, like we all worry about sending our kids outside and our kids being abducted, but actually we should be worrying about giving them this thing, which yeah. gives them access to things that can literally change who they are and unfortunately change others around them because just I mean, I found that quite fascinating and I didn't realise the psychological impact that watching pornography has on young young adults, young just people in general. I, I really didn't think it would have that kind of effect, but apparently it does, which is kind of scary. I mean, obviously for an adult, we know that's not real life, but for a child or a growing teenager, you know, it's not, not, the, not the fact at all. They, they kind of just think, oh, this is how it's meant to be. I'm looking something up and I have to be very careful as to what I look up as to what results I'm going to get because, <laughs> because yeah, what Google throws at me. Um, because I remember reading, um, I won't, I won't go looking for it because who knows what will be thrown up there. Um, I, I remember reading a stat, I can't remember what it was, but it was hugely concerning, like 60% or something, something more yeah. than, more than 50%. Of, of teenage kids in America who film themselves having sex for the first time. So the first time they ever have sex, they film themselves doing it because they well, they watch porn and that's what they've seen. And so they film themselves. And talk about a fucking digital footprint. Imagine that being out there when you were 23, 24, 25, and you're trying to get the job as a lawyer or a doctor. That's what comes up when someone Googles you. Oh, no. I just think that as parents it's our responsibility to teach our kids the scary world that's out there but we fucking don't even know the half of it ourselves because we're new to it too so like i feel like you and i are probably quite smart when it comes to what's out there i don't know i mean i don't want to toot my own horn but i, lot, I watch a lot of documentaries and stuff and i because i'm in the industry and have seen a side to it that a lot of people don't see i'm like there's no way my kids haven't phone until they're you know teenagers at least but there's a lot of parents out there that don't think that, that think that it's okay. And that's what scares me for the world is that there's going to be kids out there that aren't raised with that level of understanding. Yeah. Or I don't know how you prepare kids for it. Well, and those parents are called fucking idiots. Sorry, yeah. to, be, sorry <laughs> to be blunt. But if we, are, yeah. if we are truly preparing our kids for the future, you know, I yeah. think about, my job as a parent as much as possible is to and, and and i've got some terrible traits about me i'm not trying to 
Yeah, same as shit don't stink. Um, yeah. But if what our job is is to prepare our kids to then go on and be the next generation to run the world, then surely we want to set them up in a way that they have the best chance of being successful. And yeah. I don't think, as silly as it might sound to some people, having a smartphone at 10 years old is doing that. In fact, I think it's doing the opposite. I think it's doing the absolute opposite. I, I say to my kids all the time, you need to learn to be bored. You know, yes. when I was a kid, I, I would miss the five o'clock bus on a Sunday because yeah. cricket ran a bit late and I'd have yeah. to just sit there and wait for the six o'clock bus. And that's where, if I was lucky to remember to bring a book with me, a book came up. But if I wasn't, I would just have to sit there and wait. And yeah. it's actually a skill to be able to wait and be bored and not have to have something. My, my kids, and look, and I should make this very clear, I'm not saying that I've got it sorted in my house either. Like my kids have a, a, a noise the crap out of me. I'm like, okay, let's let's do the dishes. Oh, can we put music on? Dude, there's like four minutes with the dishes to do. Yeah, yeah, but we, we find it easier if there's music going. <laughs> like a four minute song oh, to get guess, the dishes done. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I know exactly what you're saying because you almost want to be able to raise your kids in a world without technology so that they can appreciate the world. And then when they, and like you said, be, there's nothing wrong with being bored. I've done blogs about it before. Boredom actually increases your imagination and your imagination increases your intelligence. It's like the t boredom and intelligence go hand in hand. It's like you have this, this, these streaming platforms. We don't have any connection to the, to the TV. So my kids actively never watch ads. Mm. They literally just smash out TV shows within days. You know, I remember, oh, I think we've all got these memories, especially when you're our age, of like people running to the toilet and being like, tell me when it's on, because you're waiting through the ad break and you're yelling, it's on, and everyone comes screaming back into the lounge. Like, we don't, but my kids don't have that. And so there, there is that part where even having ads actually creates a sort of environment where you, you have to learn to be patient yeah and you have to learn to like okay well i'm going to do the dishes on the ads or whatever like i don't know there's a whole lot of stuff that obviously when we were growing up people parents from the 60s were probably like ah it was way better in our day you know so. uh, yeah and look i i think the difference is i mean you're saying I, and I know you weren't saying this as an absolute but kind of growing up without technologies would be good for the kids i think for me it's a really simple idea and a really hard mm. implementation. And that is, mm. this needs to be our, we need to be in charge of this. This mm -hmm. doesn't need to be in charge of us. Mm. Cause, because I don't think my parents' generation had it better than me growing up, or I had it better than these kids growing up. This age we live in is incredible. And I mean, it's gonna be more yeah. incredible on July, on June 20th or January 20th when Trump disappears. But, um, <laughs> But, yep. you know, the, the <laughs> things we can do and the things we have and the access to technology, it's the mm. best it's ever been. I know, now, it is brilliant. But, it's just scary as a parent. <laughs> yeah, but people just need to figure out how to make technology their slave, not to be a slave to yeah, technology. And also, you know, you said before, the parents that don't give a shit about their kids on phones are fucking idiots. Yeah. I agree with you because I think it's, you know, a lot of parents say to me, Oh, but kids have got it, so I can't not let them have it. It's like, yes, you can. You are the boss. You are the parent. Your child is not the parent. Your child does not tell you. So you end up being, your child ends up being annoyed with you. That is the job as a parent is to not be liked from time to time because you have to enforce boundaries. And like, my kids aren't even teenagers yet, so they haven't really even started pushing those boundaries. But I can tell you I am not afraid to not be liked by my children. Absolutely. And, that, and if I, a parent ever says that to me, like, and I'm actually, I'm in a different situation than you. You might hear it from people looking for parenting help, whereas I might hear yeah. it from a mate over a beer or something. Um, yeah. It would be like, well, who's the fucking parent? Oh, yeah, sorry. So, the, so, yeah. so your child says they want it because their friends have got it. You know, what happens when their friends, you know, get a car at 15 and your child doesn't have it? Yeah. You're going to buy them one of those as well? Or what happens when, you're, when your child's friend goes to Sydney for the weekend because their parents yeah. can afford it? You, you're going to take your stuff. It's like, it's, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's stupid. Unfortunately, it is, It is. Um, you know, kids are cruel, right? So if you don't have something, they can bully you because of that. And I hate that. 
That's why I'm like, parents, I wish there was like a mandatory rule where parents can't give their kids technology until <laughs> a certain time, you know? Imagine how much <laughs> easier it would make life for everyone. Well, that's probably as well also where things like schools and stuff need to get involved. I'm actually not sure what the policy is of phones that, uh, I mean, my child's just finishing primary school, the youngest. Oh, yeah. I don't know what it is. The reason I don't know is my child doesn't have a phone, so it, it's not relevant. Yeah. It's but not relevant to you. Yeah. A- actually, in saying that, it might have been good to know because, you know, the uh, an eight-year-old having a phone during class time, I'm sure that doesn't happen. I'm sure they must have to lock them up at the front of class or give them to teacher or something like that. But, um, you know, once again, if a kid turns up at five to nine, the phone goes into teacher's desk and then at five past three, they get it back again. Less chance for bullying. So that bullying thing perhaps comes down to also how schools handle technology and, and what their rules and stuff right. around it are maybe. But that's, but, but that's, you know, sometimes I get a bit, a bit annoyed with people talking about how life today, you know, you know, people can get bullied so much easier and da 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 da, and you know, get teased if they don't have phones and da da da. And I'm like, well, that's true, but it's just the 2020 version of that, you know. Yeah. I mean, in 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 my day and age, if you had the wrong, I'm showing I'm showing my age, I sound like a caveman, but if you had <laughs> if you had the wrong cricket bat. Oh yeah. You know, you'd, yeah. you'd get teased or bullied for it, yeah. or if you didn't. Didn't have the right shoes or or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah, you're right. You're right. And so it's, so the thing is, it's always been here, right? Mm. Mm. The difference is now, and this is where parents need to re- realize this, is is maybe in my parents' day you could get bullied at school and on the way home from school. Maybe yeah. in my day you could get bullied in the house with people calling the landline. And yeah. now the child can get bullied in their bedroom via their smartphone. So yeah. what you want to do, in my opinion, sounds not that I'm one to give advice, but is if you want to reduce that risk, one of the things you can do is go, well, your phone can't be in your room. Yeah, don't get from the phone. Yeah, totally. When yeah. I, I used to do some work with Ian Grant, um, who was a parenting dude back in the yeah. 80s and 90s and whatever. And when um, personal computers started to become a thing, his role, his suggestion was personal computers, you know, home computers should be in a general space yeah. because then parents can see what's going on and, you know, if kids are getting up to something, the parents are there, like in the lounge or in the family room or, or whatever. Whereas these things now are hundreds of times more powerful and yeah. we're happy for, we're, we're happy, I guess I'm talking about society, for kids to have mm-hmm. them in their pockets and have them in their bedrooms. I'm like, actually, yeah. it's, it's a bigger conversation. Yeah, it is. Absolutely agree with you. And as my kids come, kids come into that time, it ha- I mean, I've always known that I will, I'm will. i anti them having a phone. So they can't bend me. They can't change my mind. They'll never be able to do anything like that. And it's been interesting watching them just with devices like iPads coming up as young kids having access to iPads. My husband and I noticed a tendency towards addiction with them and because we're both into technology quite heavily, we were like, oh, that's it. They're not having the iPads. It's super easy. We will now control when they have it. I know many parents that the kids are on iPads the moment they wake up up to, or devices of any kind, tablets, and then they come home from school and they're on devices and they go to bed and they're on devices. And for me, I just like, you know, we're talking about that positive um, reinforcement that you get from social media. You also get that from playing games and stuff. So they're never going to want to give it up. It's like, you always have to have restrictions and you have to be a parent and parenting's not easy right like it's not supposed to be easy and unfortunately tablets make it so that you can be like here you go don't talk to me for two hours you know but even that's not new I mean that's the no. same. That's the same as just putting your yeah. kid in front of a TV, having the TV. Yeah. Like I, I know people, and again, I won't mention names in case they hear this and listen to this. But every time I walked into their house, like it was when Sky TV had kids channels, and you know, like four or five, yeah. and like literally, whether it was three in the afternoon, seven at night, seven in the morning, if I walked into this person's house, there was a kids TV channel on. Moving on. Yeah. It was pre devices, but it's mm-hmm. like. Again, it's just the, and I think this is something that we need to, I think parents go, oh, what can I do? It's like, actually, no, none of this is new. It's just no, the new yeah. iteration of it. Yeah. So we need to figure out how to best deal with it. If you were into parents in the in the year 2002, 
that was mm. if you didn't want to have that kids TV channel on all the time, if that would have been who you were, then you shouldn't be okay with your kid having a device all the time now. You got to figure yeah. out the new way to do the thing that's always been here. Yeah, that's true. I think it's so easy for us to get caught up in techno like you say like technology is not evil it, it, it is an amazing thing but it's also there's also been other things in its place in the past it's just the new thing that's here do you yeah. have many like rules and restrictions on on like tv and stuff in your house we don't watch a lot of tv uh we don't watch basically any broadcast tv um because oh, yeah. who does um <laughs> the uh, we don't have a lot of tv on uh, possibly in the evenings. I mean, the, my kids and I have gotten to a bit of a habit about having dinner in the lounge because normally the dining room table is covered in my crap where I've been working all day. Uh, yeah. And that might turn into, uh, like, we watch this program uh, with a guy called Adam, Adam Conover uh, called Adam Ruins Everything. And it's basically oh, okay. a, a factual program about interesting. Yeah. He basically comes in and he tells uh, why all these well, well, what's the word? All these long-held beliefs are wrong, yeah. so he ruins them. Yeah. Um, and yeah. like we might watch a half episode of one of those three or yeah. four nights a week. Uh, we yeah. watch movies, and you know one yeah. of the things I'm excited about in the next couple of weeks is I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to Christmas movies. I've already started watching them on my own. That's how much of a geek Love I am for them. Love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've already watched Santa Claus, the Santa Claus again because it's one. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I saw one the other day called The Fat Man. And I'm really keen to see that. Um, <laughs> What's that on? Uh, it's uh, it's a more of a, it's like an adult movie. It's like um, uh, it's like Home Alone meets Die Hard. Uh, okay. Apparently, there's the storyline goes a kid is unhappy with uh, the present that Santa gave him, so he hires an assassin to kill Santa. And <laughs> Santa's like a real hard ass kind of you know. Do you yeah. think do you think this is the first assassin who's come for me? So it looks <laughs> it looks like it could be quite funny, uh, but oh, but not for children anyway. But so one of the no, things no, no. that will happen over the next few weeks is there'll be lots of movies, and yeah. that feels different though because when we're watching movies, I make my kids put their phones away. It's like you don't have That's phones true. and movies. It's like one screen, yeah. or I say, or you can piss off to your to the other room and play yeah. on your phone. I give them the option yeah, sometimes, and they always pick movie, which is yeah. an interesting thing. They always pick movie. That is good. That is good. I, we have rules around the TV. Um, we don't let the kids watch TV in the morning before school because we find it really dis disrupts their whole routine. Yeah. And then I, we let them watch TV after school. At the moment, they're young. They don't have homework. And I'm, I mean, my justification is this: they're tired. I don't care. You can watch TV. That's fine. Sure. But by five, they have to turn it off. And then, like you, at night, we all sit down and we actually usually watch something together. We've been. We let the kids start watching The Mandalorian. So we've kind of been watching that one episode a night. But we also watch these quite factual shows on YouTube called Kutzkazad. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Or um, what's the other one? Oversimplified, which is basically it talks about history, but in a really super simplified way. And it's fun. The kids really enjoy watching it. So we don't do a huge amount of TV compared to other people, but yeah. It is what it is. But I think in this, in this day and age, the TV thing has kind of taken a bit of a back step. Like, I've been talking to my, my, my dad's 80. He's coming down to see me next week. He's coming down from Auckland to yeah. Dunedin. Um, and I've been talking to him about smart TVs because he's a cricket fan. And I'm like, he's watching the Black Caps on a little iPad at the moment. I'm like, Dad, it's time to get a smart TV because then you can have yeah. your then you can have your Spark Sport up there and, you know, you can watch it on yeah. your 42-inch or whatever. Um, and what I realised was they're not TVs anymore, they're screens. Mm. Because I, I I mean, occasionally television will go on. Like I was I was uh, working last night at 10 or 11 o'clock and I happened to flick through some channels and saw 8 out of 10 Cats does Countdown and it's like one of my favourite shows. So I, yeah. I, I I watched it on TV. There was ad breaks. It was crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I think that I now think about the TV as a screen because it yeah. shows Netflix or Disney Plus or YouTube or I yeah. use my Apple Apple AirPlay and, and send stuff to yeah. it from my laptop. And when you start to yeah. think about it like that, and then you think, well, if I add that to the iPad or the laptop or the yeah. whatever, it's not so much how much TV's on, it's how much yeah. how many screens are on. And that can be yeah. a bit concerning sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you do you get worried for your kids getting older? 
with technology? Like, I know you've got a 16 year old, did you say? What do you, do I get worried for them? What do you mean? Like, like you say, with regards to, I don't know, just being exposed to all the stuff on social media, like we can control a certain amount of it. I don't know how much control you have with your kids' stuff, but do you, would you, I don't know. Like th- as an adult, I still struggle with stuff. Yeah, I think for me, once, once they reach a certain age, it's like they talk about whatever the age group is from three to five years of age. If you haven't put a certain whatever into them, they'll never have it sort of thing. I think yeah. by the time they're in what we call sixth form, which is NCA yeah. level two, yeah. um, I think they pretty much, when I say are on their own, they're never on their own. If they've got parents, they're never yeah. on their own. Yeah. But I think they that's that's probably the time for me to go, you know, more hands off where you have because I'm not with the uh, my children's mother anymore we sort of mm-hmm. also have some parenting stuff where we go uh, the kids are 50 50 uh, when yeah. they turn 15 we give them a little bit more autonomy they can choose to spend 24 hours extra on one while the other so rather than coming over on Monday they can come over on the Sunday and rather than leaving the following Monday they can stay till the Tuesday when they're 15 and when yeah. they're 16 uh, they basically have autonomy to decide when they want to go where. And yeah. at the moment, my 16-year-old is basically living with her mum because that's what that's what they've decided and yep. that's what's going on. So so for my 16-year-old in particular, uh, day-to-day stuff at the moment is happening primarily with, with their mum. Yeah. Um, but I also think because we've sort of put in place, you know, uh, women the female body has this this natural biological thing that happens that sort of allows this transition into adulthood um mm. boys don't have that so much um but i still think it's important to have some kind of key markers as to when you've reached a certain point in your you know natural growth and for us we decided at 16 when they have autonomy as to where they live and how they yeah. live, that sort of it. And so it would probably be a bit weird to then also be as restrictive with someone who has more autonomy. Um, yeah. So that, that's that's yeah. how we've done it. So I've got a, a 14-year-old who will turn 15 next year. There's still yeah. plenty of restrictions around, around her for times and where the phone is and stuff. For the 16-year-old, as I said, pro- lives with her mum at the moment. Um, mm. But I would assume if... if if they were with me in that time period, there'd be far less. Maybe, maybe not no restrictions because you're still a parent, but there'd be far less. Yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, <sighs> it's a big wide whole, world, eh? Yeah, the whole thing really does scare me. But all I can do as a parent is try and prepare my child for, like, to be resilient, but also try and deal with stuff that comes up. You that, know, that's the word though. Like, Resilience is the word. Resilience yeah. is the most yeah. important word. Yeah. And my daughter is very um, sensitive and she reacts um, a lot to what people say. So it's, and I'm not used to that. So it's a lot, it's a very big learning curve for me to try and teach her that resilience. And like, it's okay that people say things you don't have to take it personally. That don't, doesn't mean that it's against you. But I don't know, just the whole social media thing with that teaching them resilience because no one taught me resilience because my parents didn't have that coming up so it's like i'm kind of leading the way on this and i don't know what i'm doing and i don't want to fuck my kids up at the same time you know the the other the other thing to think about though is and like i talked before about how i haven't mentioned my kids on the on brook any broadcast and you talked Mm. about how you had talked about your kids names and that kind of stuff but i think it's really also important to acknowledge that there is no one size fits all no, what's right, right. Yeah. what's right for you and your kids mm-hmm. is not necessarily right for me and my kids what's right for me and my kids like i said 16 or adult, uh, you know have a, a, not quite autonomy because they're still a child but gaining yeah. autonomy at 16 other parents yeah. might laugh at that and go shit 18 others might go well 14 yeah. you know and yeah. and and I want to make it clear that I'm always happy to talk about my thoughts and my experiences and that, but I'm never actually saying I've got the answers for you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't, yeah. I don't know what you need. I don't know what your child needs, but hopefully yeah. you do. And hopefully people don't just throw their hands in the air and say, Oh, I don't know. Because when we have, I, when we have problems in other areas of life, we don't often do that. We don't often throw our hands up and go, oh, who knows? You know, if you if you need to save up X amount of money to get product Y, 
you put a pal- yeah. you put a plan in place. You know, I'm going to have to put yeah. ten dollars aside a week or whatever it is. Yeah. And it feels like maybe because it's interpersonal relationships that it's more difficult because there is so much more gray area. But I think planning, which is which is why I, I sort of started this conversation with my 14-year-old about university. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm making mm-hmm. it very clear to, to her that I, I'm not saying you have to make a decision at 14 and stick it with it for your life. But, yeah. but it's also the flip side to that is it's okay just to kind of start thinking these things yeah. because it's – it's much easier, I think, to get to a, an out, a desired outcome with a plan than it is kind yeah. of, this might come back to our business conversation with a plan yeah. rather than just kind of going, well, let's see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. And I think in life, like you just said, in life saying, oh, let's just see what happens is not usually that productive. And having any kind of just rough outline is always helpful, even if it changes. I guess it might be, it, yeah. And I, kids, and oh, I don't know. I think the idea about even if it changes is true. And in fact, just to bring it yeah. up, one, mention it one more time, the whole conversation with the 14-year-old about university said to them very mm. clearly, you know, you might get to the end of a first year of study and then go, this is not for me. 100% fine. Not a yeah. problem. And I said, look, look at, look at my kind of broadcasting career not the stuff i'm doing now when i was working in radio you know i was working as a as a teacher terrible 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 primary school teacher so got out of it much to the absolute joy of the whole education sector but (laughs) what i did was went back to university and studied drama did a postgraduate stuff in drama because i was going to go back to university i go back to secondary schools and be a drama teacher Mm. whilst i was doing that got an opportunity to work on juice tv whilst i was working on juice tv got an opportunity to work for more of him in auckland Bingo, bango, yeah. there's the next 20 now years. Oh, yeah. God, that makes me feel old that I <laughs> <laughs> but, but so I had a plan and yeah. it, it went off and yeah. it was fine. Yeah. yeah. But often the plan is what helps you just gain momentum and like gives you a bit of direction to start with. And I think that's, and like just going back to like even just the parenting aspect of like teaching kids resilience, like that's my plan. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know. I don't even know because my biggest worry as a parent is that I'll stop. I'll, I will try and reassure my kids, but put them off wanting to talk to me about their problems because I'm reassuring them so much. Like, oh, you shouldn't worry about that. Don't do this. I don't know. It's I. I worry about so many things as a parent. Sometimes I think my brain is too open, and I wish that I was more tunnel vision. But the other yeah. the other thing I was going to say when I said that what's right for yours may not be right for us is mm. if we can accept as parents that we are also failed beings yeah, and we don't have the answers and we are yeah. going to fall short, um, I think that's a lot easier than to do our best. Like I think sometimes we get caught up, like, like you said before, yeah, I have to get a phone for my kid because they say their friend's got one. So it actually... I'm I'm more than happy to stay stay the course of no, if I'm wrong, yeah. so be it. I, I don't have to have all the answers, but if we give ourselves permission to be wrong and give ourselves permission to not be the expert or not be perfect, yeah. then, then I think then we've kind of got not that we need an out per se, but we've sort of got an out that says uh, I'm gonna, I'm doing my best, and you know maybe my child much like I needed counseling about some things when I was younger and mm-hmm. maybe my child will also have their own therapist in their 20s and 30s so be it I accept that now and I'll just do everything yeah. I can to give them the best possible outcome rather than actively and this kind of brings us back to that conversation again try and do what I can as a parent to give them the best possible outcome as yeah. opposed to the worst and coming back to what we talked about you know the smartphones and what that does to a kid's brain mm-hmm. in my opinion at too young an age is one of the worst yeah 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 i agree and i often say to my kids i'm not afraid to say it like i don't know what i'm doing (laughs) i'm i don't like i i know that i have to guide you and i know that i need to teach you but sometimes i actually don't know what i'm doing so bear with me and i i don't think there's anything wrong in having an honest like it's like when you get upset it's like yep i'm upset right now and that's okay for you to see me upset so it's also okay for you to know that I don't know everything all the time. Even though I tell you I do know everything, I actually don't. And I think that kids like that sometimes because it it lets them know that there's room to move. You know, or maybe mum doesn't have it right and maybe we can talk to her and, oh, I don't know. It also means you're a human being. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. like I used to, I used to joke when I was working with, you know, in primary schools. Um, mm. I don't talk about that much because it was such a terrible moment in New Zealand history. Um, <laughs> but, you know, to teach an eight-year-old, you only need to be as smart as a nine-year-old in theory. Yeah. Because nine-year-olds know more than eight-year-olds, you know, and, and that kind of philosophy in parenting is like, actually, I, I've, I've, you know what, I've parented a 15-year-old before, but I've never parented a 17-year-old. So what, yeah. I, I don't know. Well, we'll have to see what it's like parenting a 17-year-old. What's it going to be like yeah. parenting 20-year-olds? Fuck, that freaks me out completely. I've got no yeah. idea. Yeah. You just live in the reality that you've got, right? Yeah. And you yeah. do what you can to survive. And I like I, I do like that you you said that everyone has a different parenting style. And this is very much my own philosophy. And this is why I do what I do is because I like talking to parents about parenting things because I need it to be known that just because we do it differently doesn't mean that we can't coexist in the same space. Like it doesn't just because you choose to give your kids um, devices doesn't mean I don't like you. It's very easy on the internet to get into that mindset. Yeah, I think like, oh, we don't do it the same. I think probably um, like-minded people gravitate towards each other. And so probably people who follow you and look to yourself are probably at least more open-minded than many because you do also have a sector of society that says this is the way you raise your kids. You know, and that's yeah. that's more difficult. I mean, you know, the I mean, I don't know where you sit on this, so I should probably not look to your response to this, but you know, the, the family first supporter type of parent who thinks oh, that yeah. the only way to discipline your children is to smack them and that's the way to do it and that's I, the proper way to do it. And you know, yeah. the, though I, I would imagine those kinds of supporters wouldn't like to go on to uh let's say a uh particular page <laughs> talking about uh, you know, um this one here, the Christmas list uh is what we want for our christmas list is a fucking break i would suspect i would suspect that wouldn't get much uptake from the from the um you know that that brigade no, or that, and i'm using them unfairly because it's got nothing to do with them but that kind of person so yeah you, you probably find that people who follow you are at least somewhat open-minded i would think most of them are yeah some of them are but that's okay yeah it's like the bonus of having social media is that you get all walks of life yeah Hey, um, um, we've been having a chat for, gosh, a good hour and a quarter now because this is like a tart as it flies by. But do you have anything, just as we wrap up, perhaps to share with us about kind of parenting kids Christmas? I, as I said, you know, you want a fucking break. I saw another one of your posts earlier that talked about uh, it's beginning to cost a lot like Christmas. Oh, God, uh, yeah. Oh, look, I have to tell you, look, let me, let me, let me actually let me bring this back up because I think this was really yeah. good. This post here um, oh, yeah. about shopping locally. I think the yeah. I, the idea of shopping locally is great as well, but I think what you've done very well in your post here, and I won't read the whole thing out, but it's pointed no, no. out very clearly to people that actually shopping locally is really expensive a lot of the time, and some yeah. people can't afford to shop locally, and that's why yeah. places like the warehouse is a place most people get their kids' undies and T-shirts yeah. from as opposed to, I don't yeah. even know the name of a flash local brand. Um, I don't either. And it's actually okay. Yeah. It's it's sort of the same as I get into conversations with people about free range eggs, and look as much as possible. I like buying free range eggs and getting free range eggs. But you know, if someone's on a low low income and all they can afford is a dozen caged eggs, it's yeah. it's okay. I mean, I, yeah. I, I'm I'm not okay with the idea of the cage system, but at the no, moment, at at the moment, if someone's only got three bucks fifty to spend on eggs, then yeah. I, it's better for them to have the protein. And the you know Absolutely. to be able to to buy cheaper eggs than it is to, you know, not at all. I look. I actually know as I say that out loud, I can hear the pile on coming in the background, because I am I am also aware that the more we propagate this horrible system of cage farming, the more it will exist. But there's also yeah. a, a day to day reality of how people need to live as well. I think you have to marry but, those two so, things up. You know, worrying about uh, eggs coming from an animal that's caged is a privileged thing to do yeah. because there's a lot of people out there that are so poor that that is, like you say, it's not even on their radar. They're like, I just need eggs to fam feed the family, you know. Um, I just feel bad because at the moment there, especially at the moment, you know, with COVID and everything that's happened, you know, local businesses have really struggled. So obviously there's a big push online for support local, but local is really expensive. And it's often out of a lot of people's reach, especially here in New Zealand, like middle, even middle income lo local is expensive. And the warehouse is, even though it sells international products and overseas products, it's actually a local business. And all the businesses here support New Zealanders because they hire New Zealanders. So it's like, 
you might not be supporting a person at home like a mum in business that's physically making something but you're still supporting New Zealand by shopping in New Zealand and not buying from overseas yeah you know yeah it's such yeah I mean this year has really been quite hard for so many people I think I watched something on your Instagram where you were talking about it's been such an intense year for so many people and I just hate the pressure that's out there on anybody to be and do certain things, which is why I wrote that post is because there's nothing wrong with the warehouse. There's nothing wrong with, I mean, there's nothing wrong with these things because it's a privilege to worry about where things are sourced, you know, and the, the amount of packaging that's in a, because I got a lot of pushback from that, but oh yeah, these places, they have a lot of packaging. It's like, but that doesn't matter to someone that can't afford much. It's not on their radar. Yeah, it's like I work, one of my clients is a, is a fruit and veggie store in Dunedin, doing amazing things. And one of the reasons they do so well is because they have direct relationships with growers in Central. And what they then do is they don't, uh, the growers, oh, I probably can't say that publicly. Um, <laughs> let, let me put it this way, because I don't want to, because I can't talk about the relationship with the growers to a business because the growers have relationships mm. to other businesses. But let me put it mm. this way. Um, they they keep prices as competitive as possible by choice. They yeah. could put more profit on there and still be cheaper than some of the other places. Um, yeah. And they, they do it because it's good. And, and every now and again, um, like I work, I do their um, social media and all that kind of stuff. We'll put a post up of a really good price of, you know, you know, three avocados in a bag for a buck 99 or whatever it is. And there's yeah. always inevitably one person going, Oh, <sighs> If only they weren't wrapped in plastic, I'd buy them. But I just <laughs> refuse to. I'm like, fuck <laughs> off. You yeah, know, it's like, it's like, what do you want? You want them wrapped in a hemp made, recyclable, yeah. perfect for you. Like you talk about first world problems and a privileged yeah. thing to be able to say. Whereas I look at it and I think about that lower socioeconomic family in South Dunedin yeah. can maybe afford now to get three avocados rather than going totally. to another place and buying three ninety nine an avocado. So, yeah. anyway. Yeah, no. No, no, I hear you. It's um, I don't think people see it as a privilege. I think they see it as something that's a necessity. But it's like I think that in itself is, oh God, I could just don't even get me started. It's like you're living in a bubble where apparently people like where that's the most important thing is the packaging of the avocado. It's like what about the people that can't afford the avocado? They don't even <laughs> give a shit about the packaging. Like, oh yeah, it's. I feel bad for people out there that don't know that there's a world outside of their own. <laughs> you I, know? I quite often um, think about what would happen in the world uh, if we weren't so privileged, so to speak. Mm. Um, and I think about conversations that we have primarily in the Western world, right? Mm. Not so much in other parts of the world, but the white Western world that we yeah. seem as so very important that I watch a, a documentary series called, what's it called? Something like Life in Alaska. Life Below Zero. It's about people oh, living yeah. in Alaska. And yeah. I watch this family, uh, a husband and a wife who have got seven kids. She's Inuit. He's, um, I guess, Caucasian, American, whatever. Yeah. Um, and they've got seven daughters. And you know what? These conversations never come up because they're out on the ice uh, fishing, hunting for food, yeah. looking to survive, and I just kind of think, you know, it's they, they they don't have these conversations that this white Western privileged world has about how society yeah. should be. And it's not yeah. important. It doesn't mean that some of those things don't exist in that area, but they're certainly way down the list. And I, I sometimes think about conversations and I go, you know, if a if a if a plane or a or a or a cruise ship got lost and ended up all those five hundred people were on a desert island and that was a yeah. society they lived in. I wonder how many conversations about, I don't know, packaging, how many conversations around, you know, look, we've got yeah. one chicken, should we just let it run free or should we actually put, yeah, the, put, the, put, the, put the fucking thing in a cage so we can get its chicken, so we can get its eggs? You know, how yeah. many how many conversations yeah. around gender pronouns would there be? How many conversations, yeah. do you know, in, in an absolute situation where you were talking about survival, so all of those things feel like they are quite a, a privileged thing for us. Privilege meaning... I don't want to say non-essential, that's too far, but um, yeah. the other parts of the world have more to worry about, like food on the table, 
than yeah, than, um, than even where their foods come from. Yeah. It's so easy to get caught up in our own bubble. Like I, I think, I, I don't know if you said it in this in this in this Instagram post that you did about, you know, we're so lucky to live in New Zealand, and I think we are, but you can get caught up in that bubble anywhere in in uh, first world countries and forget what it's like in another world in another country, even within your own country to have, you know, when you're living in poverty. I think Christmas, that it's, Christmas, I think that it, the it's all relative, isn't it? I mean, I remember yeah. I've got friends who have come back from living in London where they used to drive up the M1 and they laughed because Auckland's motorways were a doddle compared to the M1. So they lived out in Helensville. And then after living here for 12 months, they're like, fuck this traffic. I'm moving closer to the city because it's relative, <laughs> because it became their reality. Yeah. That, yeah. that thing you're talking about, I won't play it, but if people go to my Instagram, you'll see, oh, yes. you'll see yes. it. It's, it was, it, it's an idea that I have. And you can see yeah. that hashtag up there is you be kind to you, you be kind yeah. to you. Um, and it's too long. It's 12 minutes. Yeah, that's why I don't know old people on TikTok. If I was smart, I would have done it in 55 seconds on TikTok and got a million followers. Edit it but, down. Get your friend to edit it down. Um, <laughs> but the idea that actually we don't, we haven't this year, I think, and I'm talking about my own experience, but when mm-hmm. I talk about it, lots of people have said it resonates. Um, yeah. we haven't given ourselves the space this year to actually acknowledge how hard it was even for those yeah. of us living in New Zealand where life compared to the rest of the world is, is, is a bit of a doddle you know meaning easy yeah. like like I read, yeah. a, I, I read a report the other day that said New Zealanders are basically living as if COVID doesn't exist but, it, but even within that the stress yeah. and the life changing events and the way the world yeah. has changed has impacted yeah. us and I don't well I haven't and from me doing this conversation, I'm hearing other people say, yeah, I haven't done that either, have actually even acknowledged how much it's kind of fucked with us this year. And so what I'm saying now at the moment, and this will be my next post probably, is um, one successful one success in 2020 is worth 20 successes any other year. Any other year. So if you yeah. achieve one thing this year, right, mm. that's the equivalent mm. of achieving 20 other things in any other year. So, so celebrate that one thing. I absolutely agree. It's definitely been, I think, like you said, it, you get so caught up in the fact that we're not as bad as other countries, but actually we have our own struggles, our own issues. And just even hearing that bloody thing on the phone, that alert is huge and messing with our minds. I remember anytime I hear Jacinda or, you know, having a, an emergency meeting, I'm like, oh God, we're going back into lockdown. You start yeah. getting the palpitations and you start, and it's valid for us. But know, but we're, and they're saying that we're the lucky ones. Like one thing I have talked about yeah. is we, we do talk about like, you know, male privilege and white privilege. And I've said this numerous times. Yeah. I definitely have New Zealand privilege. Like, yeah. like, like there is like, like being white or a male, there is no reason that I should be in New Zealand. There's no reason yeah. why my parents' DNA, you know, caused me to be in this country. I've got no yeah. control over being here. So yeah. I, I think it's fair to say that I have, and maybe many of us have New Zealand privilege, and I'm happy to stand yeah, up and mate. accept that, and then also acknowledge that there's no reason why you know I, I I haven't been a part of another country that you know is having deaths up the wazoo, mm-hmm. and Struggle. this is what it is. Yeah, it's definitely been a year. Hey Maria Foy, it's been so nice to talk to you. Thank you, and it's been lovely to talk to you too. Um, the the best place for people to find you because you've got a big, as we said, the, you know, a significant following. What did we say? It was twenty six million? Is that right? On um, yeah. on Facebook or something, but also your uh, blog in itself is Happy Mum yeah. Happy Child dot co dot nz. Is that the best place to go? I guess that's got all your links to all your socials and stuff there anyway. Yeah, all my social stuff is listed at the bottom and stuff like that. And yeah, I am on a lot of social media platforms, but I predominantly focus on Instagram and Facebook. Right, and you do kind of daily vlogs on um, on Instagram. Is on that what stories. I read? Yeah, I do um, daily vlogs on my stories, which right. isn't very exciting at the moment. But even in yeah. this conversation, where we kind of where you're kind of going, what's happening next with me? I mean, is there anything you can tell us for the kind of up, pardon me, upcoming few months that you've got planned? Anywhere people can keep an extra eye out for you? Uh, no, I just did an ad on TV for Vanish. But I haven't got anything coming up that's exciting like that. So, and do you want to I tell do, do you want to tell people who are looking at you thinking, "Crap, that's not Maria Foy" because she used to have long hair down to her shoulders. Do you want to share that at all? 
I did. I used I, in May. I had this idea that I wanted to chop all my hair off. So is that what you're talking about? Yeah. I cut my hair off. Yeah. Yeah. I just I have a lot of hair. I have thick wavy hair, and I thought I've just wanted to shave it all off. So I thought I'll shave it off and I'll raise money for charity. So I raised some money for three great charities and chopped it all off. And I made a decision that I'll keep it short for at least one summer, so I can experience it maybe without that sweaty head. And so far, it's proving to be the best decision ever. It's like twenty six degrees outside, and my head ain't sweating like it used to. So, <laughs> so what? You're not you're not going you're never going back. Um, I I won't make a decision on that, but I'm just <laughs> enjoying it at this stage. Um, I think that there's a lot of people out there that, especially, it's been really interesting watching kids at school react, like especially girls. Like, why would you cut your hair? It's like, well. You know, girls can have short hair too. We had this. Um, I had this conversation with someone just the other day. Maybe, maybe, yeah. and 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 actually, I should be careful because I was going to talk about older women with short hair. So I know, sure, cause that's <laughs> what not are the, you going to say? That's not the reason. <laughs> but isn't it funny how, like, and primarily, and it's not all kids, but you, you know, girls at primary school all have long hair. Girls yeah. at intermediate and secondary school, some of them will start to go shorter. Uh, you know, adults will start to get a bit more professional looking, but they'll still. Females will still primarily have longish hair, but by the well, time they yeah. get to their sixties and seventies, it's like yeah. I reckon the majority have short hair, and we're all going. I wonder why. Is it because something yeah. happens to the like? Is it creatine in the hair that it's harder to have longer hair? Is it just because it's easier? I don't know. Yeah, no, but I always vowed to not be that person that has short hair when they're older, and now I've turned into that person that has short hair. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know what it is. I, I do think it's probably a maintenance thing. You know, you get to a point where you're like, eh, I just can't be bothered dealing with it anymore. But I don't know. Who knows? What, what a perplexing know. way to finish our podcast today. Yes, yes absolutely. With Maria Foy. <laughs> Do you have a lot of hair on your head? Or are uh, you coming up? No, I, yeah, I'm, I, this is, I, I, I've got too much at the moment. I, uh, I, I got, I, I have a lot. To me. <laughs> That's my widow's, my, I have a big widow's peak there at the front. The reason, uh, yeah. the reason I wear hats is primarily because I'm too lazy to do my hair. Um, oh, and yes. I've figured out since having a beard, I have to brush my face. And ah. when one has to brush their face, I'm not going to fucking brush my head at the same time. <laughs> no, yeah, just one thing to worry about. <laughs> So, hey, um, it's happy mum, happy happychild.co.nz. It's been yeah. a lovely time chatting with you. Thanks for yeah. giving us some time this morning. And look, uh, I'm sure we can and I'm sure we will probably maybe catch up in uh, 2021 or something. Definitely. I'm not going anywhere. I've got no other life. <laughs> 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 life All right. Very boring. Thanks, Maria. <laughs> Thanks, Pat.